This is called the Ballade de Ton de, the Ballad de Ton de Dame de Ton Jadis, the Ballad of the Ladies of Times Past. It was written by Francois Villon, 15th century French poet, described by Wikipedia as a poet, thief, and vagabond. It is famous for its refrain, Mais où sont les neiges d'antan? This was translated by Dante Gabriel Rossetti as Where the Snows of Yesteryear, and was mangled, it's often used, it was mangled even in Inglorious Bastards, Mais où sont les neiges d'antan? Where the snows of yesteryear, or hula hoops, or greaser hair. Incidentally, this is going to be, I have a book coming out of these with a lot of cartoons, and this is going to be, they're all going to be illustrated with my little cartoony things. Where the snows of yesteryear, or hula hoops, or greaser hair, miles or bird blowing the blues, the jet set and those Pan Am stews, hot pants or the bubble dress, the Bader Meinhof, the SDS, moon rocks red, pet rocks, rockets red glare, Italian scooters everywhere, mood rings, love beads or condomania, sunny and chair to entertain you. Could you dish up nouvelle cuisine, master of fresh pinball machine? Can you do the frug, the jerk, the twist? Were you and Liz or Susie's list? But that I think is quite enough of rootling through the thrifts for stuff. Forget the easy memorabilia. I want to thrill you, chill you, kill you. So follows, we make the scene. The race for the four minute mile. See the pyramids along the Nile, Audrey Hepburn spiffing style. Carmen Miranda in a tropic isle, Bobby Short at the Carlisle. Woo! To the dark half of the dial. This may take a little while. Jane Mansfield in a speeding motor, Vic Morrow underneath a rotor, Mark Chapman outside the Dakota, Robert Maxwell does a floater, J. Edgar Hoover's files and bile, Squeaky from at the Manson trial, O.J. Simpson in denial, the way that Enron made that pile, Bernie Madoff's tiny smile. Mais où sont les neiges d'antan? We know just where those folks have gone. Where have the war reporters gone? A bottle of dewers, your Olivetti, your boat is waiting at the jetty. Brash mercenaries at chartered plane, you're off doing that dumb stuff again. Biafra checkpoints, Lebanon, there you're a bozo with a gun, you're an action hack, you're Superman. Now magazines are drained and wan, nobody's calling you at dawn, mais où sont les neiges d'antan? Where are the snows of yesteryear, for instance, la vie littéraire? What happened to the literati who'd flocked to a George Plimpton party? The feisty writers of the lanes beating out each other's brains. Kurt Vonnegut and Irwin Shaw, Norman Truman, absent gore. Mais où sont les neiges d'antan? Where have New York's last writers gone? Off to tenure, every one. Mais où sont les neiges d'antan? Have the photographers all gone? Ask Henri Cartier-Bresson. Irving Penn, Dick Avedon, Bailey Duffy, Donovan, Helmut Newton, Guy Baudin, and ask who Mary Ellen Marks, three toucher is, wait for the sparks. Don McCullen, Jim Nactway, Photoshop wiped your world away. We've pixelated verite. Now phones take pictures everywhere. All that is solid melts into air. Where are the snows of yesteryear? By the way, all that is solid melts into air is a direct quote from Karl Marx's first communist internet communist. Um, where, where, where the ladies, where the babes of times gone by? Chin chin pudding, here's mud in your eye. Make yourself comfy, sweetie, by. Stunning dress, honey, wanted it to look even more. Stunning lying on my bedroom floor, that always got the room in a roar. The sun cast set, the roll in the hay, the cows away, please won't you stay. Hiding the salami, fun games to play. Mais où sont les dames du temps jadis? And do they still remember me? Okay, now we're in Italy, the Dolce Vita, the Veneto, an MGM starlet in the Palazzo, the paparazzi and the go-go-go, scandals erupt in El Specchio, and suddenly it's Roma Adio. Mais où sont les neiges d'antan? Where have the Playboy princes gone? So it's off to London, Babylon, where we have reinvented fun. No more war, but lots more pot. A rich girl in a Fulham squat. Peter Sellers and Sophia in Elvira's Trattoria, Michael Caine and Terence Stamp dine at Annabelle's Dancer Tramp. Art and fashion both go pop, while the last of empires going under. Keith Moon, Sid Barrett and Brian Jones, no more rolling for that stone. Have all the birds of Britain flown? What of soul was left, I wonder, when the swinging had to stop? Chow Manhattan, we're Euro trash. You need class and we need cash. Late afternoons in Fiorucci, Plato's retreat for Hoochie Coochie, Mortimer's and Jackie O, El Morocco studio, the VIP room waits below. What happened to that snow we know? So the drifting snow snows of memory, twin towers appear in front of me, 
The Twin Towers not of Tolkien, but Twin Towers built for businessmen. That time on earth too big, too dumb, just skyline hogs on the waterfront, perfect for Philippe Petit's stunt, then they were blown to kingdom come. By death and grief and fear defined, two perfect forms, hope and despair, float suspended in the mind, glimmering in our darkening air. So it's back to you, Francois Villon, poet, thief, vagabond, and con. It's fine for to sign for les, it's fine to sign for les neiges d'antan. What we'd really like to know is will we see tomorrow's snow? And will there be tomorrow's snow? Well. Thank you. Okay. Now this is, um, I happen to think, by the way, that the Tea Party, I don't know why everyone speaks so badly of the Tea Party, and so this is a little piece in praise of the Tea Party. Some things I know. Some claim that the president belongs, this is the one I want to go up on YouTube just before the election. Some claim that the president belongs to one of the wickeder Chinese tongs. Some insist he's paid by the Vatican or Google by way of Burning Man. Some say he's a huge Al-Qaeda fan, or he's been training from youth with the Taliban, or that William Morris planned his ascent, or the Goldman Sachs made him president, or that he was groomed by Actors' Equity, or the Ford Model Agency, or the Church of Scientology, or the IMF, or the KGB. Sheer fallacies, follies, pure fantasy. Just ask yourself this, say have you ever seen Satan and the president in a room together? His henchmen will say that's coincidence, and true of some other presidents, but beware that devilish subtlety. Everything's crystal clear to me. Some other countries, what I'm doing is alternating, slightly loopy, but with sheer madness. Some other concerns I'd like to share, you've seen those baldies everywhere. They're easy to spot since they mostly wear black. Not ordinary folk who've lost their hair, that's an innocent natural lack. But those shiny domes whose superior stare, all artsy-fartsy, nose in the air, twinkly-toed and debonair, well, they have baldy scientists who know how to train your hair to feed messages straight to your brain. Then zap, you're a zombie, a veggie, a pod, on your knees, adoring a baldy god. They're hatching their plans in secrecy, but everything's crystal clear to me. I may not matter too much to you, being that I'm not smart or famous or rich. You may discover before we're through that I can be one difficult son of a bitch. You see, we're a million-headed man. Each of us thinks a bit differently. But every one of us knows of the plan to keep us in our place indefinitely. That's their selfish mentality. But we'll know when the time is ripe to make a move, get up on our feet and take back what belongs to us. Then we'll break the shackles of so-called security, incinerate the NEA and lock those so-called artists away who are trying to turn our children gay, incarcerate the sex industry, redefine civil liberty. Oh, there's streets in store for you and me. Everything's crystal clear to me. When aliens from beyond the stars thought to check out the human race, they knew they would need a welcoming space, a dive you can find just about any old place, where they can probe our, part, probe our parts at a leisurely pace. So they're here, disguised as Irish bars. Those shamrocks and harps are decoys designed by an evil galactic mastermind. As I'm sitting here over Jameson or three, everything's crystal clear to me. Global warming's a ludicrous lie. Listen on up and I'll tell you just why. Would the good Lord have given us motor cars without safe supplies of affordable gas? No birds in the forest, no fish in the lakes. Their numbers are lies, their pictures are fakes. Those warmers are in a conspiracy. Everything's crystal clear to me. And suppose I'm a fraction out on this. You're going to burn twice, but I'm heading for bliss. Our names are written in a golden book. A friend of a friend of a friend took a look. They, the book is in a cavern board in the mountain where our nukes are stored, awaiting the call of an angry lord. I have this on the highest authority, so everything's crystal clear to me. I think one light, light-hearted, actually this is serious, is a light-hearted one. Uh, it's called Bad Shoes Blues. Sing the Bad Shoes Blues, it was an offer I couldn't refuse, nothing but my self-respect to lose. Now I've got the Bad Shoes Blues. This is actually autobiographical. The song's not for twats, they know what's what and just what goes with their Manolos and Jimmy shoes. This is for guys who aren't too wise, whose eyes are on snooze when they choose their shoes, who've got the Bad Shoes Blues. I've drawn the line at chiseled toes and improbable chemical glows and black and white brogues and no, 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 no's and I've been shoe shopping in Beverly Hills where I bought some bright red espadils. Back in the day in San Antonio, Tony Lama was the place to go. 
I bought some cowboy boots, black vinyl, bright. For that special occasion, a society night that just might end in a fight. A Mount Lebanon warlord, Christian, not Druze, gave me a pair of his very own shoes, soft peanut leather and an excellent fit. I took off the tassels, but they still weren't it. I've got trainers of extreme design, an ultra aerodynamic line, so perfectly right if I was training to run at the speed of light. Otherwise, there's little excuse. It's just bad shoes, blues. Do I hear heels clicking? Are they coming my way? Is that clip tip clopping on a nearby highway? Is that a tap tap tapping up in the sky? Sounds like they'd be here by and by. Sounds to me just like good shoes. Shoes that'll take me wherever I choose so I can stop singing the bad shoes blues. Okay. Now, now I thought I might read a few little bits from this book. You know what, my glasses are extremely weak. Uh, okay, I'm actually going to begin at the beginning. Not everybody's memories of those years are as clear as spring water, but Antonio de Portago can summon up a specific evening of Studio 54 as clearly as it was running through a projector. De Portago, a French countess by heritage, a chanteuse with a punk band, The Operators, by calling, was sitting at a balcony table. There were a few sofas and you could rest, she says. We were a whole group. There was Elsa Martinelli, Helmut Berger, you know who was in The Damned, Mick Jagger, uh, one of the Neocos is a girl from Manila. The balconies were halfway up the Metamorphose Theatre and, and Quondam TV studio. On either side, people furtively sidled into the infamous unisexual bathroom, not necessarily to pee. Beneath was the dance floor, pulsating with the beat of disco, which is very close to that of the human heartbeat, where dancers, washed in the surf of sound, dappled and splashed by light, shed the dull gravitational tug of quotidian life and lost themselves in what was at once a voyeuristic jostle like a fairground in a domain of the self-absorbed like a ballet for prima donnas only. Over the dance floor tubes stuffed with light bulbs Flash Gordon star were rising and descending and how yet the spoon made its rhythmic journey to the insatiable nose of the man in the moon discharging a, a fizz of light the photographer says the club was thronged with the studio menagerie that might that night. She can, I'm sorry, these glasses are not. I, I forgot my good glass. Um, she cannot remember the precise cast list, but it certainly must have included uh, heavy squads of toffs and tuxedos and evening dresses, plenty of pretty preppy girls and boys, studio employees, the waiters and bus boys bouncing around bare-chested and sneakers and gym shorts and of course the, the camera bait again of course the camera bait the camera bait those whose pictures showed up in the post the news people and magazines worldwide would, would, would certainly that evening have included uh, themselves also other famous faces and there would have been uh, predictables like Truman Capote, Rudolf Noriev and the uh, and the starlet of the moment but beings who looked truly out of context, as though they had winged in from a different movie, like a Republican senator in a heavy gray suit. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm having a real problem. Does anyone have stronger glasses than mine, by any chance? Does anyone have 200s, for instance? Um, this is very poorly planned of mine. I'm really sorry. Are you, you, I'll, I'll, I'll plough on. Just excuse me. Ah, oh, let, let, let me just try. How much? Oh no, I, I wouldn't even be able to see the book with that. <laughs> um, the dance floor was the former stage. Grouped around it were Puffy Bonquette. Beneath the balconies were the main bar, which was pick-up central. Ignored by both was a discreet door in the wall that opened onto the stairs that led to a VIP room in the basement. Above were the bleachers and, and so forth. I think that gives sets the seat. Oh, thank you. Let's see how that is. It does seem to be a bit better. Yeah, thanks. Um, 
Okay, flash forwards. This is, this is true. We agreed to meet in the Danceteria because the private dealer, capital P, capital D, because the private dealer spent a good, time of time in, a good deal of time in nightclubs and Rudolph's Danceteria was where the nocturnal pixie dust was glimmering. The rich boy and the party girl who were to affect the introduction patrolled the upper floor, Antonio de Portago, again, but Antonio de Portago was to perform, so there were fashionable uptown faces cursing amongst such downtown presidencies as John Lydon, the former Johnny Rotten, in a white coat, a pill t-shirt, a black hat. Um, we found the private dealer on the ground floor, sitting motionless and alone at the, hem, at the hem of the stage. He was gaunt with a beaky nose and intent blue eyes, and his skin had the greenish pallor of flesh seen under water. He was carrying a Nikon, and whenever something caught his attention, a hairy man swaddled in transparent polythene, wearing a bird's crest, he would, da, 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 he would get to his feet and shoot or get off a couple of shots. It was past midnight. De Portago has been conventionally late. We fetched drinks, but the thudding of tape music would have made small talk painful, and anyway, the private dealer was clearly getting twitchy. We left. The rich boy and I climbed into the party girl's Mercedes, brand new but dented and squelched here and there by sloppy roadwork. She followed the private dealer as he gunned through the traffic in a bright red Maserati. His apartment was in a rundown building on the fringe of the Upper East Side. It was small, tidy, a TV set was on. No sound, there was a lot of expensive camera equipment lying around and a few magazines, but not a single book. The only decorative touch was provided by a couple of plastic oriental masks. We seated ourselves opposite the private dealer who sat stiff-backed behind an oblong desk. To his left were a telephone and a grinder. To his right, like a table setting, were a dessert spoon, an artist's palette, knife, and an oblong of plastic. To his front were a square of mirror, a white enamel scale, accurate to a hundredth of a gram, receptacles for quaaludes and hashish, and a nine-inch glass vial holding half an ounce of white heroin. For this, the private dealer paid one of his own suppliers $4,500. This might last three days. You want coke, the private dealer asked us. The rich boy and the party girl muttered to each other. She shook her head petul petulantly. Downtown, the rich boy said. They concluded that, it, that's of course Heron. They, they concluded that transaction and sidled off into a corner. Soon their heads were lowered, their backs carefully turned, as though they were, what they were doing was a bit risque, like leafing through a porn magazine at school. The private dealer, less encumbered by protocol, took off his jacket and spectacles. Working quickly and precisely, he filled a dessert spoon with a mixture of heroin and cocaine, liquefied it with Poland water, heated the spoon, and drew the liquid up into a hypodermic syringe. I have a very strong notion of right and wrong, and that has not been touched one drop, he said, as he rolled up his sleeves, exposing veins that looked like burned out electrical circuitry and stuck the syringe into his left forearm mechanically, like a heavy smoker lighting up one more cigarette. Only the constant telephone calls interrupted his conversational flow. In the beginning, only between you and me, we start only now to relate to each other, he told one client. If we cannot adjust to each other, we split, no hard feelings. The private dealer is a European who describes his paternal line as, quote, old aristocracy. He was 36 and had been in prison twice for short periods, each time in Europe. He'd set up in Manhattan just seven years ago and was grossing $500,000 a year. This is 1976. Uh, I'm in mind to have a serious figure when I finish, he said. Dealers frequently justify their ways to themselves by adopting roles. Some see themselves as dashing, piratical. The private dealer sees himself as a philosopher. The rich boy calls him my guru only half ironically. The private dealer does not return the compliment. For me, there are two basic categories. You have human beings and you have humanoids, he said. Junkies being the latter, of course. I'm in a position where I can see a lot of the true personality of people, and I cannot accept their scale of values. You're a Volksmith, a human being, so fucking low, so low, man. His, now was, his, his voice was now slurry. Anyway, it goes on. That's a kind of portrait of that particular world. Um, now, I'm going to do a little verse about the art world in all its glory. Um, it's called, based on Browning, Robert Browning, of course, a soliloquy in the Tate Turbine Hall. A brilliant but inexplicably underappreciated artist contemplates some figures in the landscape, 
Grr, because Browning has this great line, Grr, there goes my heart's abhorrence. That's the silica when the pen is closer. No, this is not me. This is the character of a... I've explained this, and I said this, and after the people say, you know, you're so right about Damien. Um, and I, I admired it. No, I'm not envious of Damien Hurst. Absolutely, utterly not. Not one smidgen, one tittle, one jot. Why should I care that he's hotter than hot? Not one iota, no thought is remoter. Do you hear me, Nick Sarota? Just because Hurst always has to be first, because he needs to blow up or burst, why would I want to see him immersed in formaldehyde next to his putrid shark and sold as a set to an oligarch? Let's whack that idea clean out of the park. I'm not at all jealous of Damien Hurst. I'm in Burlington House. It's a subject switch for some art world chow down. I forget just which. When out in the courtyard, there's a Ferrari. I trot outside to see what's the story. This paparazzi, it must be a star. Posh and Bex by the brouhaha. No, it's Tracy Amin with a bum on a car. I'm not envious of Tracy Amin, she's a drama queen. Who knows where she's been? But a word in your ear, Tracy, my dear. Whinging won't make you Van Gogh or Soutine. I really don't hate the Chapman, this is mostly about the Brits. I really don't hate the Chapman twins, they're loony bins, the Chapman twins. Francisco Goya, call your lawyer. Some of your art died for their sins. I don't really mind the Chapman twins. You art lovers are obviously all at freeze. I hope you had all of the fun of the fair. Art here, art there, art everywhere. Like bidding rings and conspiracies. Consultants with dubious degrees and lovely girls pimping galleries. Cutting edge, it's paper cuts. Pools of stage blood, but no signs of guts. Do I go to freeze? Are you serious? Please. I wholly don't need the Gagosian team. Okay, they're a multinational dream, but I wouldn't want a dealer, is that too much to ask, who looks like he's wearing a stocking mask and carrying out some nefarious scheme. And I wouldn't want to well, print my work on Satchi online. If every bad artist got slapped with a fine, it might put a stop to our culture's decline. Just calling it art doesn't mean that it's fine, so don't look for me at Satchi online. If original minds, not the usual clique, got to put up names for the Turner Prize, you might, just might get a refreshing surprise. Instead of those annual sights for sore eyes, those derivative chunks of Duchamp and chic, you might see real art, but I fantasize that Coterie will never have time for the likes of me, so they can stuff their Turner Prize up the appropriate part of the anatomy. So what should we make of Richard Prince? God knows he's given us plenty of hints. The Marlborough Cowboys as re-photographs, the jokes, jokes so lame that they limp in on splints. Celebrity pics with mock autographs. He's a postmodernist, a barrel of laughs. But then something happened. Prince painted a nurse. Then nurse after nurse after nurse after nurse. The collectors pounced, the prices bounced, at which the collectors moved into reverse. They saw the fellow had been prolific in different styles, and that was terrific. There's no product shortage like John's or Vermeer. Picasso is the business model here. But dear collectors, please sit on your paddles. Marlboro men, just hang up your saddles. The jokes flutter home to the internet. OK, I'm done. Well, not quite yet. I forgot. Did I mention Damien Hurst? I really don't want to see Damien cursed, the lord of the flies, completely defaced, his halves of calves turned to toxic waste, his skulls turned dull like diamonds to paste, his spins come unspun, his dots all gone black, his cigarette ends stuck back in the pack, while he's teaching himself to paint in a shack. Paint like bacon. Damon's dreaming. That sound you hear is Pope Innocent screaming. OK, one last bit from here. Another cheerful bit. Uh, does anyone remember Michael Eilig? Michael Ehrlich checked out of a rehab in Colorado and returned to Manhattan in February 1996. I went around to see him in the Chelsea Hotel. Jaunty was not the word. He was talking about rehab and methadone while writing out entrance passes and drink tickets for a party he was given. He was, it's a, he was a good friend of mine, and he still is. I'm so, you know, it's a hot tragedy. It truly is. Uh, it's about drugs, isn't it? He was talking about rehab and methadone while writing out entrance passes and drink tickets for a party he was throwing at night. It was to be an instant club, which he was thinking of calling rather pointedly, ill, I-L-L, -L, eagle, E-A-G-L-E. -E. Suddenly he made a fist and began sniffing up special K. Give me a bump, another club kid pleaded. Eilig obliged, then inhaled another hillock of the drug. Michael, I thought you weren't using, I said. Heroin, I'm not using heroin, he said. 
patiently as I was extremely dense. He, James and James and I, went to grab something to eat on 8th Avenue. Gee whiz, here we are again. Before party time, they were, they, then they were full of both the angel, he, Michael had killed this, this dealer. Then they were both full of both the angel killing and of Peter Gation's troubles, but spoken as if they were quasi-fictional scenes from some movie that had not yet been fully edited, which Michael Ailig and Peter Gation were both playing important parts. They're going to get Peter, Ailig said. Room had Ailig cooperating with the feds. Was this the case? What? Turn on Peter Gation, Michael Ailig, James and James said. Michael Ailig, Michael Ailig said, how can he stand to... How can he stand to look at himself in the morning? How can he stand to see his face in the mirror? Um, ah, more. Hello. Um, as for ecstasy, Ehrlich spoke of it with disdain. Ecstasy was the 80s. The line was always that ecstasy was a reality drug, but ecstasy was fake reality, Ehrlich said. You thought you were happy, but it was just a cover-up, you understand. You felt happy while you're on it, when in reality it wasn't happiness at all. K is 90s, K is reality. When you're down the K hole, that is reality. You understand what I'm saying? All the stuff you don't want to face, it forces you to face whatever has happened to you. Who wants that, James and James Street? It is reality, Ailig repeated doggedly. That's very 90s, I think. Out in the street, insanity returned. Ailig passed a restaurant he identified as one of the haunts of the departed angel and peered anxiously through the window. Look, they're looking at me, he said. Of course they're going to look, St. James said, if they see you jumping up and down and pointing and making faces like a monkey. I did it, Michael Ehrlich screamed full throttle. I did it, I couldn't stand him anymore. He bored me, I killed him. They scampered gleefully back to the Chelsea. Why do you say all that, I asked, was it a joke? I don't think it's a joke, Ehrlich said suddenly so, but I asked what happened to Angel Melendez. He was a drug dealer, Ehrlich said, his voice gone far away. Drug dealers disappear. Angel disappeared from the conversation. An inconvenient reality showed up, though. His body had been in the morgue for several months, mislabeled as Asian, was ID'd on a slab in Staten Island, etc. In the weeks that followed, there were no arrests. Um, Soon Michael Ehrlich was blithely giving a party every Friday in the Mirage, a club on West 56 on the river. This was the suggestion of another his straight middle-aged supporter, Maurice Brahm. Michael couldn't commit murder, no way, Brahm said. Brahm's like Anita Arco, like Anita Sarko, like many night people, simply couldn't imagine the mercurial club kid could have committed such a brutal act. It must be a stunt, a gothic joke, like the time that he'd show up at parties wearing a neck brace or the time he'd shown up on the Geraldo Rivera show, Rich Kids, 90, uh, Club Kids 94, made up with purplish-green bruises on his forehead and on both sides of his neck, and so forth. Um, now, we'll get back to another cheerful one. This is called... Actually, this is the one I was going to finish with, so I won't go to this one. OK, this is a little piece of New York reportage. It's called The Social Scientist. You've seen me around. I'm the everywhere man. I get out and about wherever I can. I've got an ordinary face, I wear an ordinary suit. Nobody knows me, do I give a hoot? When I hit the town, I aim for the top. My target events are the cream of the crop. If the A-list will be at a charity hop, you'll find me difficult to stop. Benefits for the ballet, the opera, the zoo, for who cares what and who gives a shit who. I sneak into dinners with the killer elite. Four cup of grand just to meet and greet and to park an expensive rear end on a seat. It's that or a bag of crisps on the street. If the clipboard Nazis start coming on hard, I can produce a business card, which somehow seems to indicate, although it doesn't exactly state, that I'm with a media conglomerate, so the clipboard Nazis sometimes won't take the risk of making a serious mistake. It's like the clipboard Nazis came from out of space to serve the PR master race and enforce each motherfucking whim just to keep us lower life forms in our place. They aren't normal humans, they do too much gym. But they don't often err in telling her from her or him from him. So learn from me or your chances are slim. Art openings are boring. The whole world can go. Even the back office party can be cracked by a pro. If you want to hang out with Gogo and co, though why you'd want that, I really don't know. Posh memorials are easy. There's never a list. But avoid movie screenings. There must to be missed. You're just making up numbers of some publicist watching made-up stories alone in the dark. You're joking, that's not my idea of a lark. 
At publishers' parties, there are piles of books. Pick up a couple, you may get a few looks, but getting them signed, that's really the knack. They're worth a few quid when they go on the stack. Promotional parties in department stores, always a horrible, sodding drag. Stuff with bores and models, stroke actress, stroke whores. But fun's not the point. The point is the swag. This shirt came out of a goodie bag. I'm not here for the goodies, the food and the drink, nor for the pussy, I know how you think. Why should I hit on a party girl when I'm a one-man gangbang of the social world? So I can be chucked out now and then by a clipboard Nazi with a poison pen. But I'm the everywhere man, I know this town. One way or another, I'll bring you all down. Anyway, that's all right. <laughs> I think we all know a few people like that. Um, I can't really read the art book, so because it's just um, because it's you know the type is the type is anyway. Um, are you ready for a couple more of these? Um, oh. Yeah, this is quite a nice one. I'm going to end up with the art one. Um, who's come to my party down on the beach? Scarlett O'Hara, Tristan Zara and Jimmy Carter drank sparkling water. Lola Ferrari, Harry Houdini, Francis Bukabia, the Dalai Lama, Alistair Crowley, the girls of St. Trinians, Arthur Crevant, Bella Lugosi, George Gordon, Lord Byron, Akira Kurosawa. I saw several Gettys getting looped and Frascati, Anna Pavlovi, Lottie Lenya, the Silver Surfer, Peter Lorre, Laurel and Hardy, Crazy and Ignatz, Muccio Prada, Salvador Dali and the Flying Orlanders, John Cale and Raikuda, Saki and Taki, there goes the Glenn Fiddick, the Baron de Meyer, Frida Kahlo, Kiri de Kanawa, John McCracken, Truma Capote and the Illuminati, getting flighty and naughty, more cocktails for each. How we're going to party down on the beach? Who's persona non grata down on the beach? Who's banned from the party? Who's not on the list? Paris Hilton, Sarah Palin, Professor Moriarty, Mark Scratchy, Thatcher, Alistair Crowley, Silvio Berlusconi, Nicholas Sarkozy, most people call Simon except Simon de Puri, L. Ron Hubbard, Liberace, Donatella Versace, Flat Earth Baptist with TV ministries, Media twisters with ugly histories, columnists with lying bylines and lilac eyeliner who kiss and diss. But you promised and promised I'd be on the list. You won't be missed. You're hardly martyrs, you're just masochists. It's hard to resist being a bit of a tartar down on the beach. What is this vision from over the sea? A giant white yacht. She hits the spot. A bright apparition, a nifty addition. She's a humdinger, a lulu, a peach. She's every possible figure of speech. But what perplexes us down the beach is why did they come here? Who can they be? Vanity Fair's taking photographs down on the sand. They found a power couple. He's plump and she's supple. They're having loads of laughs. He's fondling her hand. She's flashing a nipple. He has an old face. She has a cold face. But they'll both be in bold face. Maybe get a feature so we quite understand. The white ship is floating like a gull on the bay. There's dancing on deck. We hear music play. We're sure we've been spotted. They'll be coming to join us. Quite soon they'll be coming in ghostly white dinghies. They'll dance at our party and they'll take us away. Now comes the sunset down on the beach. It's hilariously trashy, all greens, gold and purples that turn the sand ashen until the sky blackens. The beaches of funfair, spectacular fireworks. Whoosh right above us, day bright above us. So now my party's really got started. We dance chic to chic which is when we get startled down on the beach. The white yacht is departing, it sails out of reach. We're wholly dumbfounded, we're really downhearted. No dinghies are coming, we're stuck at the party down on the beach. The beautiful people start drifting off early. The men on the gate are sullen and useless. The barman moves slowly, the waiters are surly. The beautiful hat check is sad-eyed and listless. It's quite a fiasco down on the beach. What a strange morning after down on the beach. An ugly aftermath, I hear harsh laughter and hacking, coughing, rustling in the dune grass. Some lie inertly, each next to each. It's a master class for sociopaths. I've done with roving, there'll be no more loving, there'll be no more parties, ever or ever, down on the beach. Well, I think, I'm just going to do one more, I think, if you don't mind, which is my, this is, 
a, a serious piece of art history, as a matter of fact, though taken maybe from a particular point of view. This is only chapter one. It's called The Secret History of Modern Art. Chapter one, the plot is hatched. Our story begins with Gustave Courbet, who was a communard, by the way. He knew just which painterly button to push, a slap in the face with a fat girl's bush, and his goodbye, Baldini, Bougereau, Winterhalter, Jacques Tissot, the last of the masters had their day, and the war against beauty was underway. It's a muddy road to Paul Cezanne. If you like awkward, Paul's your man. Inedible apples, unbeddable nudes, nature in one of her nastier moods. If a carpenter made a table like that, he'd be out of a job in 10 seconds flat. Your school friend Zola thought you'd gone mad, but you made it okay to paint real bad. And that was your part in the anti-art plan. So let's keep up with Vincent van Gogh's Provençal Idyll with Paul Gauguin. Then that field of corn, those terrible crows, in the sullen glare of a clouded sun. Take that yellow chair and lend me an ear. Madness has entered the picture here, and modernism has truly begun. Drossiora stuff looks placid at first, but he's painting world just going to burst. A head like Bridget Riley and Op, and that spots epidemic of Damien Hurst, to say nothing of Stephen Sondheim's slop. They applaud Siora as a pointillist. Did you know he was also an anarchist? Those pastoral clusters are only the start of negative force field too strong to resist, that will tear apart beauty and art. Pablo Picasso, a giant among men, said he painted like Raphael when he was 10. Came the Vion Rose, then his whole world blued. Did someone say kitsch? That's really quite rude. Which doctors to the rescue, Picasso plunged on to Les Demoiselles d'Avignon, catch a whiff of the girls Barcelona Pong. He shut it away, sadly not for long. Then he and Brack sliced and diced and glued. Some called it cubism, which sounded crude. So Zism's go was quite a good fit. Matisse couldn't make heads or tails of it. Luke's calm a volupté that was Henri's way, and Henri would say that a businessman after a long, hard day should treat his work like an easy chair. Picasso ripped through styles like a man possessed, as if in some eerie way he guessed the needs and the greed and the hungers he'd feed of collectors to come, a predator breed. It was Picasso wheeled out the shopping cart and created the supermarket of art. Picasso, modernism's first deity, kissed the girls and made them cry. When Gary Cooper and Chaplin dropped by, his English embarrassed him and that's why he pulled silly faces and wore silly hats. It was David Douglas Duncan's picks in life that cured his celebrity fix. When Picasso grew old, this giant amongst men, didn't paint like Raphael, but a child of ten. Raymond and Jacques really painted quite well, better by miles than their brother Marcel. But as Marcel was the toast of the creme de la creme, while Raymond and Jacques have dropped out of the frame, they're goner than gone, buster than bust, while Picasso's eating Duchamp's dust. Do you want to know the reason for this? Forget Francis Nauman's analysis. Those painful funds, et la chaux au cou, make people feel cool like nobody's fool. Marcel was a master at taking the piss. Cocteau said the trick to being a star is known just how far to go too far. Now the Picassoid garden has long gone to seed, while Duchamp Inc. makes much of the product we need. If anyone can be a bell at the art world ball, with one half smart idea, a huge helping of gore, and no visible art making talent at all. Um, now, and this is, this is the final one. This is when it's not cheerful. Oh, what a shame the world has exploded. Nobody told me it was loaded. Humpty Tumpty took a big fall right from the top of the Berlin Wall, then Wall Street, any wall at all. So, ladies and gentlemen, this is the last call. Yo ho ho, Geronimo. That's all, folks. Got to go. Goodness gracious, the world is crumbling. All the dreaming spires are tum tumbling. The Colosseum, the Golden Gate, the Tower of Pisa, the Empire State. Angkor Wat, the Parthenon, Frank Geary's, Guggenheim's, all gone. Rem Koolhaas and John Nouvelle, the bird's nest and the gherkin blown to hell. Prince Charles are taking this quite well. Whoops, there goes the Taj Mahal house and Peter St. Paul's and the Albert Hall. Stonehenge is rubble, it's goodbye to them all. My socks are sizzling, the world is burning, but who gives a shit as long as you're earning? You'll be winning the human race if you move your arm to Silas' face. The domain of lupinous liberty and wholesale hyperreality, where everything is completely free, except for suckers like you and me. Splish, splash, splash, the whole world's drowning. J.G. Pallard wasn't clowning. So Tormalinos, Tangier, Torquay, Holland, the Hamptons, and Waikiki are swallowed up by the Dead Sea. 
Malibu, Montego, Monaco, sleep with Atlantis down below. Vintage postcards record each scene. See Venice and die in a submarine. Shiver my timbers, the world is freezing. Even a listers are snuffling and sneezing. Botox and waxing and looking nice, getting on Gawker or tabloid TV. TV. It's a heat, page six, or EC Perry, or the club of the moment is a VVIP. Won't mean too much, and this is free advice when Mondo celebrity is sheeting in ice. Hubble, gubble, gubble, the world just melted. That was unexpected. I really felt it. The Mona Lisa and Manet and Monet and Salvador Dali, who was really quite gummy, and Damon's shark and the Jeff Koons bunny have all gone gooey and oozy and runny and not worth a bean in anyone's money. So it's tar for now. The world just ended. It was broken. It couldn't be mended. And to think that I thought that our trip to space meant we'd be exchanging our ruined basement for a brand new planet of stunning replacement with butterflies and bumblebees and naturally foaming seas, alpine meadows, coral reefs, rainforest downs and windswept heaths, with very few to spoil the view, just some people I like, perhaps a few of you, but it didn't work out, so it's toodaloo. Now, if anyone wants to buy a copy of this, which is the nightclub book. Sorry? I have the hard guy, but it's the paperback. Okay. <laughs> anyway, is that what? Were you expecting more? We want more. What? We want more. I don't know what. Well, I, I'm having a slight problem in reading. I've got a, what? I, there's some I took out because I thought this is very encouraging for me because I thought people had uh, less of a less of a. Okay, I've got a couple more. Now, this one is, I thought according to God I miss her. It's quite, but actually it's called for a lucky girl who made the grade. It was a bald-faced lie from a bold-faced name. Baby, don't you cry, you're just fair game. It was a nasty diss from a fashionista. You'll put up with this, you're just a B-lister. You'll never avoid it, so get used to the slurs. The towels embroidered read his and blurs. Your bright brown shoes with the dark blue suit, your yesterday's news, you've no parachute, you're no sweet for a soiree, your meat for a melee, your words are blurry because your brains are jelly, you're a four-star arse, a third banana, you've got a backstage pass to an empty bin cabana. I really liked her. <laughs> <laughs> are you ready for one more? Yes. Are you sure? Okay. This is also... Actually, I, I, I don't know, because it's going to sound like I'm very misogynistic, which I'm not remotely, but this has a lot of similar in some way. You're way too cool for your own, for my own, you're way too cool for my own good. Why did you come to my neighborhood? You sashayed into my local bar, which is where the serious brinkers are. They thought you were a reality star. We shared a bottle of Rioja. The nightcap was a bridge too far. We wound up at your minibar in the bedroom of your hotel suite, which was twice as long as my whole effing street. The pillows were soft, the sheets were pressed. As Brown Ferry puts it, you can guess the rest. It's morning, I got into the Latin juice. My true love is glued to the business news. My life was mine, out you know whose. In this town where I'd been ignored at best, I was now a desirable guest. The happening bars all gave us knee room. Every nightclub VIP room was turned into a she and me room. Woo, did we tread the light fantastic. I'd been a mook propping up a bar. Now I shine and pulse and rule like a star. It ended with a flicker of plastic. We sorted out of that room service scene. You dropped me off in your limousine. Gave me a cute little peck on the cheek. Said you're off to see your girlfriend in Mystique. You'll be back for sure the following week. A guy in the local saw you in hello. Your party made the tattler months ago. You were with a guy who stank of style, but it worked a bit too hard on his smile. I can see I was just a bit of rough. Did you drop the way you always drop stuff? I wonder just who or what it will be that does to you what you did to me. Anyway. Okay. Okay, I think that's really tested your endurance to the limit. <laughs>